What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. So, man, it's Nicholas. It is Monday, so we are diving behind the scenes, as we always do, looking at the fantasy football industry from a, a branding, a marketing, a business, uh, a personal branding perspective in hopes to kind of inspire some of you guys and, and see the different avenues and pathways that different influencers in the space have really um, come to, you know, to pave. And uh, just to show you that there are a million different ways to get to where you want to go. And I kind of want to, you know, open up those stories to show you that, you know, it can be done from, from you guys as well. And today we have uh, an awesome, awesome, awesome guest who really, ha you've been named literally on probably every episode so far. I think I've done like 15 of them and you pop up um, in one way or another, because you've paved your way in, in a way that's very, you know, niche-like. And that's, um, that, that's a big theme of, I guess, breaking out and regardless of what industry you're in. But today I'm joined by Matt Harmon of Yahoo Fantasy Sports. He is um, somewhat newly the head of like social media there. You're handing, handling everything Yahoo Fantasy football over there. You are coming from the NFL Network, and I'm sure you've kind of bounced around and then done your fair share of other things within the fantasy football space. So, Matt, I am, uh, I'm super, super, super excited for you to join us today to, to talk to the audience and uh, let them know, you know what you're up to, where you're from, where you're going. Yeah, well, where I'm going, uh, that's the hardest one of the, <laughs> of, the, of the group there to answer. But, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to know that people are uh, paying attention. That's the, point. that's the point of this business, right, is to get people to pay attention and to talk about you. <laughs> um, hopefully good things, so that's nice to hear. But, yeah, so basically my backstory, um, to try to make a long story short here, yeah, I'm currently with Yahoo Sports. As you mentioned, I was with the NFL Network for three seasons, uh, and – you know, I'm, I'm not from L.A. I live out in L.A. right now. I moved out here for this job, uh, for, for the NFL job. So um, definitely came from a unique place when it comes to getting into media. So my original life plan, and again, I'll make the long story short here. My original life plan we'll get was to actually go, yeah, yeah, well, it was, was to actually go back to, to school uh, and get a Ph.D. in social theory and some of the social interaction uh, sociology studies that I was doing as an undergrad you know, basically my plan, because when, when you're a sociology major and you want to continue to pursue that further, uh, really the one thing you can do is become an academic and, you know, that's about it. So, so I decided to take a year away from school to try to get some, you know, real life experience. And during that year, my life uh, turned up and down uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, maybe we'll talk about some of that later, but during that time, I really found that I had, a, and I guess I knew this all along, I had a passion for writing and I had a passion for football. And that was the moment when I decided to marry those two things together. I started a website just for fun, just to keep myself engaged. Uh, and, and so I started studying film. I started really diving in depth into the game of football and created my own website, Backyard Banter. Uh, and you know, I got out there on Twitter, started sharing my work with other people, uh, people that I had, you know, respected and followed for years. And that's, that's one of, I think, the coolest things about this industry. And I noticed that right away, like guys like Sigmund Bloom or Matt Waldman, um, these guys who I had followed and like revered as analysts for years. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, they, like they, me right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like you get to connect with these yeah. people like, on social media and everything. And that's what's so cool about this and like I, I was blown away by that right away and you know for guys like Sigmund to tell me hey you're really good at this all that sort of stuff I started to think like man maybe I should just pursue this as a career you know I'm young I was 22 at the time um, you know I, I think I can really try to make something out of this and so I threw myself into it completely to uh, studying the game and becoming the best analyst and writer that I could be um, I mean, I had no idea that it would take me to where I am now, but uh, you know, about a year and a half after that, I was moving out to LA to go work for the NFL Network, and you know, now here we are. So um, it, it's been a wild ride, but that's kind of, again, long story short version of it. Yeah, so you got a lot going on right now. Now, you, you talked about the, that website you originally created, Backyard Banter. I, I was aware of like some of the work you were doing on there from a, from an uh, analysis perspective, but I hadn't known about like some of the interviews and the sit downs that you were doing that are like similar to this. And I, at someone on, I forget what episode it was. I think it might've been Jason from the fancy footballers like, Oh, this is kind of similar to, you know, what Matt Harmon was doing with backyard banter. Um, and then I started looking it up and I saw, you know, Sigmund Bloom was your first, uh, your first guest on there. Now, can you like kind of backtrack and tell me what was the inspiration behind that? Because for me, 
Uh, as much as it is like seeing the backstories for a lot of the fantasy football analysts, I I'm more intrigued by the people who are um, innovative and, and pushing the industry forward. You know, we have a lot of great people who do like great research, but I mean, no disrespect to them. I don't really have a lot of interest in them coming on because I want to, to hear more about like the branding and the business and, and that kind of side. So for you, was it just like, oh, these guys, you know, I've always looked up to and I just want to have them on my on my show and like talk to them. Like, What was the inspiration behind Backyard Banter? Yeah, it, that when you mentioned this interview, and especially when we were talking before we started, I was like, yeah, this sounds exactly like what uh, I was doing with Backyard Banter. And I think we had similar goals, which is to inspire the next group of analysts. And maybe that seems like a, I, I don't know, a, a stupid thing for me to have been doing, like after my first uh, season working in the field full time professionally. Um, but I, I, that's why I didn't want to sit there and talk about me. I did eventually do an episode on myself because people wanted that. But uh, like, I wanted to talk to people who had been established, who had been in this business at various levels and in different specialties for many years to, to talk about how they got there. Basically, you know, everybody's asked that that has like a cool job. I mean, people ask me all the time. I mean, you just you just asked me basically, how did you get your job? And I wanted to basically have people come on and answer that exact question. Uh, so that was really the impetus of the show was to inspire the next group of people to give them because it's so hard for me to write in an email or a DM or a, especially a tweet, like, here's how I got to do what I did. Um, it's much easier, I think, for people to sit down and listen to engaging stories by a variety of different people to tell that backstory and see how you can try to follow a similar path, maybe not the exact same path, to hopefully one day reach a similar goal. And I think it comes back to, for me personally, I feel so fortunate just to be here. Um, to one, to be alive, to like, to, to be, here we go. <laughs> yeah, to be, to be in this space, doing what I'm doing right now as a professional football, fantasy football analyst, like this is my job. I can't believe it a hundred times out of a hundred, you know, it's, it's the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. I feel indebted to, in, to inspire and bring in the next group of people because the universe has given me a great gift and I feel responsible to share that with other people. So that's really kind of the more mushy grand view uh, idea of why I did a uh, backyard banter. And it was fun. And I, I mean, I can't do it at this point anymore just for time and financial yeah. reasons. Uh, it, you learn very quickly that your time is money <laughs> and uh, for something that really wasn't going to, you know, wasn't going to bring a lot of income in. I had to stop doing it. I miss doing it. I know other people miss the podcast, but I'm glad that somebody like you is now kind of continuing doing the same sort of thing. And there are other people out there doing uh, similar projects as well. And that, that makes me very happy too. Yeah. I, I mean, we had mentioned it real quickly right before the show too. It's like, I feel indebted in a way because before I, you know, ever took a leap, like I, I left my job or did anything like that. I would listen to some of these podcasts, not in the fantasy space, because this is far before I had any idea what I wanted to do, but I had always had like this creative itch to, pursue something more and I had no idea where to start and I had no idea like what would exactly you know set me off and, and set me onto that path and there was you know interviews like this and I would go onto the app store and type in like entrepreneur interviews or whatever and I had no idea what I was doing but I'd listen to them and I'd be like yeah I love this I don't know what I'm going to do with it but I love it and I'm hoping that like someone in the audience doesn't even know that this is like the path that they want to go on and this kind of talk right here you know makes it happen for them so that's kind of the goal behind this series too and i'm sure you know there's just so many similarities between uh what you were doing and what i, I plan to do and want to continue to do with with the influencers in the space now with this interview this i, I think with you it's going to be a lot different than the ones i've had with other people because you are someone uh, I think is kind of similar to me in that I don't know if you're religious or not, but for the majority of people that are like millennials, I would say we, we are spiritual, but most of us are not religious. And I think a lot of the way we think is uh, a mindset game and it's a mental game and you don't really start to think that way. You don't think it's that important until you become one of those people. And I think that's like, you know, 75 to 90% of the battle realistically because everyone puts the hard work in. Now, some of the hard work you put in prior to um, really, you know, blowing up with, was your baby reception perception, right? Now, I'm sure most of my audience, because I cite this work all, all the time, but for those of uh, my audience that don't know what reception perception is, give them a, a quick breakdown of your work. Sure. So reception perception is an in-depth methodology that I developed to evaluate the wide receiver position. Really, the overarching goal 
is to put quantitative values behind the qualitative reality of route running. I mean, we hear terms thrown around all the time, like this guy's a great route runner. This guy gets open all the time. This, this quarterback never has anybody open. Um, I wanted to go out there and actually answer that question. Uh, so what I do is I chart eight games for an NFL wide receiver, which I've found to be a significant sample to represent a whole season's worth of uh, route running and work. Um, and I chart how often they run each particular route, how often they get open against man coverage, how often they get open against press, and zone, et cetera, how often they get open on each individual route. And there's a lot of different metrics that come out of it, you know, mostly success rate versus coverage metrics when we're looking at each individual route and each type of coverage, as I mentioned. I want it to be in-depth and to answer these hard questions when it comes to the game, but I also want it to be simple and more consumable uh, for just the average fan once they kind of dip their toes into the series a little bit, because uh, I think that's really important as well. So yeah, basically I'm, I'm trying to give you information about the wide receiver position that you can't find anywhere else. And that's really hard to know on game day because you know, these guys run off the camera and, and we don't get to see them. So this is bringing you something, a little look behind uh, the curtain when it comes to the wide receiver position. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much like an identical answer to how like Graham Barfield explained his yards created thing, which I think is just like a phenomenal column along with the reception perception because so much, like you said, it's like, oh, you know, no one's ever open. His routes are smooth. It's whatever. But like all that is subjective until you put numbers and until you make it analytical, right? So I think it's kind of cool seeing how the whole fantasy space is like starting to deny just like subjective analysis and like we all want more of, of the things that you're doing with reception perception. Now, how long ago did you start Reception Perception? And what was, like, was that part of Backyard Banter? And what's the path, like, what has been the path of it? Because I know now it's it's part of the Ultimate Draft Kit for the fantasy footballer. So, like, to give us a brief history of where it started and where it is now. Sure. So, and just to go back to the point that you were making, I think that's what's so cool about being in this space right now is that, especially fantasy analysts, but they're also just analysts in general, like, no longer willing to accept these old, long-held cliches. We're all willing to ask really interesting, difficult questions about the game of football and why are, why are certain just things just accepted? And are those really true? I mean, the reason I love data and analytics so much, whether it's you know from just pure objective stats or taking games and charting them and, and putting a rubric to your film watching, which is what I think reception perception and yards created as well. And other series like that are really trying to do. Um, that's so in, exciting to me is to, is to be able to test these again, these, yeah, like you said, these just long held cliches or things that we just kind of generally accept and really bring some actual measurement to them. So I think it's just such an exciting time to be in the space because of that. Now, how reception perception got started. I, I did post the first reception perception article on backyard banter uh, in June, 2014. So that was about a few, I guess maybe six months or something into deciding that I wanted to pursue football writing and football analysis as a career. Um, and when I decided to make that decision to eschew whatever grad school plans I had, whatever life plans I had uh, before that, it really was apparent to me that, look, I am a nobody. I mean, I'm still a nobody, but I, I, at that time, I really had no connections to media. I wasn't a former player, obviously. Uh, I was not, I never worked for a team, anything like that. You know, I had no reason to be taken seriously. And I think this is something that people confuse when they get started in, in writing. And yeah, when I first started, I was doing just traditional stuff on backyard banter, like power rankings or, uh, fantasy, whatever, start, sit stuff. But nobody – J.J. Zacharyson said this best on his episode of Backyard Banter, episode three, I think it was. Nobody cares about your opinion on those things until you're established, until you've established an audience. So you're not going to es establish your opinion by just doing the same thing that everyone else is doing. Right. So to me, it was, okay, what is something about the game that I don't see being asked or, or at least don't see being answered? What's content that I would want to see out there? And to me, it was wide receivers and route running. For whatever reason, I always loved the wide receiver position. And I thought to myself, okay, my question is always, you know, what does that mean that this guy is a good route runner? You know, who, who really – at that time, you really started to see the wide receiver position develop into these different, type, these different archetypes. You know, I think back to the 2000 – or what was it? 2007 Patriots, the one – the undefeated season, whatever. Like, 
that was a perfect example because Randy Moss and Wes Welker were two incredibly successful wide receivers that could not be any more different from each other, right? Like what was even, to, in my mind, just watching the game, like what is even the point of trying, because, you know, we always get into these stupid arguments. Who's better? Randy Moss or Wes Welker? Like, I mean, for one, obviously it's Randy Moss, but <laughs> like what, what is the point of even trying to compare those two players to each other? Because they're doing such different things. And I thought even beyond just evaluating route running, something could be done to categorize and put these receivers into these archetypes better than just how we anecdotally talked about it. So that was really the impetus for why I wanted to do it for two reasons. One, it was a question that I had. It was something that I wanted to see out in the space. So I was going to be the guy to do it because for reason number two, there, 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 you have to do something to stand out in a crowded space. Look, I have a great job. As I said, I'm very thankful for it. I know there's probably hundreds of people who could do it as good, if not better than me. So why should I be the one in this position? Well, I had to give a reason for that. And, and, and that was the, the reasoning behind uh, reception perception. And the reason it took, you know, I didn't start doing it right away is I wanted to make sure it was good. You know, I spent months back testing it, doing different things with charting routes, uh, looking at different realities, putting the information out there in different ways, just privately to myself. My dad likes to recall a story coming to my uh, crappy one bedroom apartment in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, and, you know, seeing all these papers strewn across the floor. And he's like, what the hell are you doing in here? So I was like, dad, I'm working on this idea. (laughs) It's a route running receiver thing called reception perception, but I'm I'm working on it, you know? So like, that was kind of the, the, the baby steps of it until eventually I decided to put the, the first post out there on backyard banter. And then uh, when I was hired by football guys later uh, as a freelance writer, started doing some work uh, for them with it. But it's, yeah, it's really developed into something that I, I never could have thought in, in the media space. Yeah. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty crazy to hear the origins. If only you had some, some footage of your dad walking in on you. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, that, that, that would be, that would be great for the docu series uh, reception perception. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's funny. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's blown up into something that's almost, I mean, I don't want to say household name because fantasy football is just so small still, but like within the fantasy space, if you, you know, any, anyone that's like on Twitter, if you say it, they know exactly, you know, what you're referring to. And now, you know, like I said, I, I don't want to like dive into like too much business talk because I do want to get into more of like the life and, and health and, and mental state kind of stuff. But I know that the reception perception is in the UDK with the fantasy footballers. How did you guys originally link up? Did they reach out to you and were like, hey, we want to offer this as a unique value, like selling prop within our UDK? Look, as with many things in my career, uh, I kind of fell like ass backwards into it in a way (laughs) through just a little bit of fate. Um, And well, not necessarily because when I've when I've wanted things in this space, you know, I've just trusted that the right thing was going to come out there. But also I've put myself out there. So basically what I did was like in my first off season away from my first off season working at the NFL network, I was mostly just still doing reception perception on backyard banter. Occasionally doing some freelance articles like for the Washington post who picked it up uh, was there were the first, like, I guess, national big outlet that reached out and was like, Hey, uh, Neil Greenberg, the editor uh, for the fancy stats side of uh, the Washington post saw the article um, cause someone shared it and this was back before the NFL network. So that was kind of my first big national writing gig was doing reception perception, uh, articles in the Washington post. That was great. And, you know, so I was still doing some of that in the off season, my first off season with the NFL network, but the second off season away, I, I thought, look, I mean, there's more that can be done with this. Um, but I need some help, right? Like you got to know what you're good at, what you're not good at. I'm good at, charting routes I'm good at analyzing wide receivers I'm good at um writing I'm good at I'm now I'm now think I'm good at being on camera not them that was way before that but like you're good I I knew what I was good at I knew what I was good at but I knew that there was more from a business side from a web presentation side that could be done with this so basically I kind of just put myself out there I, I tweeted hey I'm looking for a new home for reception perception this year like websites come talk to me, (laughs) you know, like basically that was it. And uh, the fantasy footballers reached out pretty quickly and basically kind of pitched me the idea of, Hey, why don't you be a part of the ultimate draft kit? 
um, you know, we'll work up a deal together. Uh, and I think it's going to be beneficial for all sides. And, and, and it really has been. And the way that they have taken my information and one, I mean, they make the charts now, which is a, a freaking godsend yeah. because I, I, it was such a time suck to do all that myself. Um, they have made spreadsheets that generate the information very quickly after they're I just pretty good over there. Yeah, they're pretty good. They're great. I mean, yeah, I mean the ultimate draft kit in and of itself, I'm not going to go into a full sales pitch, but if you want to buy a copy, go to reception, <laughs> reception, perception.com. There's a link there. Link down below, uh, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. the <laughs> there we go. Perfect. And, and I think that the, the cool part about what they do is that, like I said, the ultimate draft kit is incredible all on its own. There's a wealth of information there before you even click on the reception perception tab. But the way they have taken my baby and dressed it up, uh, like the way all the spreadsheets look, it's awesome. I, I, I'm so happy with, with, with what they've done with it so far. Um, but yeah, I mean, it all basically just happened because I put myself out there. Uh, you know, this is before I would ever think about something like having an agent or anything like that. This is just, uh, Hey, look, I, I'm out here marketing myself. So you got to, you got to do it some way. I have a following on Twitter. Let me just see if someone wants it, wants this. So uh, there were, there were other places that offered too, but this was clearly, and not to mention too, I also trusted these guys. Like I, yeah. I had met them up, up until that time. I was the only person that had ever done an in-studio show with them. This was back before they had their big fancy studio and now they're all big time, whatever. But like back when they were just, their studio was a. Uh, Can't get a text uh, back, man. It's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, man. It's miserable. But no, back when their studio was just a, a spare bedroom in Andy's house down in Phoenix, Arizona, when I was driving cross country, Mike hit me up. This was like, like I said, before reception, perception, ultimate draft kit, partnership, whatever. Mike hit me up. I was like, hey, you're, you're in Arizona, like traveling the country, like swing down to Phoenix, like let's hang out and do a show or something. So I did. So I'd met these guys. I trusted these guys. I knew that right. they were smart. I knew that they were doing something good. And it was a good partnership, and it has continued to be a good partnership. And I'm excited. This will be uh, the third season that the uh, Reception Perception has been in ultimate in the Ultimate Draft Kit, and uh, you know it's it's only getting better. It's it's very cool. Yeah, it's a very cool value prop to their kit because there are a lot of people now that are starting to create their own you know draft kits and draft guides, myself included. And you have to be able to differentiate yourself when you're trying to to sell it, and that is one of them. If you know if that information is not available, it's something you put a lot of work into, and it's it's like a very valuable resource. So you know, everyone can do the top sleepers and the top busts and all that kind of stuff. Like, and you will get sales based off of the fact that it's your audience, but something like that not only brings in your whole audience on that side of things that, that they don't have, but it gives, you know, that, that unique value prop. And that's so important, like with whatever you're doing, not just selling things, but trying to build an audience, trying to network, trying to do really anything. It, it, it's the fact that you need to have something unique about you and it doesn't need to be anything crazy. It's just, you know, just be yourself and that's unique enough. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to gas those guys up too much, but I will for a second because, as you mentioned, like I bring an audience with reception perception to the ultimate draft kit. But what's so incredible about them is that they have built an unbelievable audience and ecosystem all on their own. I, I remember the first time that they had me on their on their podcast. And this is back in the very, 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 very early stages of our relationship before we had met in person and way before reception perception, the ultimate draft kit partnership. You know, I was at the NFL network and like I went on their podcast or whatever. And even to this day, people will tell me like, yeah, I found your work um, through being on the fantasy footballers podcast. I'm like, wow. are you serious? Like that's unbelievable because yeah. that's just a credit to what they've built, which is an unbelievable empire, honestly, because I'm somebody that was working in NFL network. I was writing for NFL.com. I was on the NFL fantasy live podcast. And you know, now I'm at Yahoo sports, like these big national audiences and people are finding me based on being on their podcast and now working with them. That is an unbelievable credit to them and why they are so brilliant in this space. Yeah. I mean, it just speaks to really like the, the overall space that you see, not even within fantasy, just like any branding or business or company it's just like they've played that game so well and they know exactly how to market themselves and brand themselves and they've done it at such an ex exponential rate and they just they've taken advantage of the fact that like fantasy is is very new and there was only like three or four players in the space at, at a popular level and they took it into their own hands you know when when you are your own brand it's like there's no gatekeepers there to tell you what you can and can't put out there so you connect with a lot more people that haven't seen 
things outside of, you know, Yahoo or ESPN. So when you, when it gets super, super personal to the level that, you know, that they are, and they always talk about how like the, they want the audience to be the fourth member at the table and they do such a good job of love of like having that value, but making sure that that stays true throughout every single episode. So, yeah, I mean, for real, they, they are like very much paving ways in the industry. And that's why I wanted, I, I, I like needed to have them on, on, on for this interview. I was like harassing them on Twitter. I was like, Andy, 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 let's go. And then uh, <laughs> it was the first interview on here and it couldn't have gone better. So yeah, for real um, salute to them. But I, I, I think what else is amazing and I had read your story probably a few years ago when you first originally posted it is your, your pinned tweet right now on your Twitter profile. And it's, you know, the long blog post that you wrote up uh, kind of about your struggles coming up about your weight issues. And it covers a whole bunch of different topics that are, you know, just relevant to just life in general and a, a lot of struggles that people go through on an everyday basis. And if you guys out there, it will be the first link in the description under the video. Um, I would really, really, really highly recommend you go read Matt's piece about, you know, it's very personal, very raw, very vulnerable, um, but it, it it really, you know, it's inspiring. It, it helps you kind of open your eyes to see like Matt's a normal dude, but he put in so much work and he went through so many struggles in order to get to where he's at today. Like nothing was given to him while he says he like fell backwards into things and he got lucky. Like, sure, maybe there were a couple breaks, but he, he worked his ass off to get there. So thinking back on it, you wrote it, what, two or three years ago at this point, when someone like me sees it three years ago, whatever, three years later, and I'm saying like, it's such an inspirational story. What does that mean to you? Like, what did you imagine the reaction would be when you, you know, when you hit submit on that piece? <laughs> a lot of, uh, I imagined a lot of different things and not all of them good. Um, obviously the outcome has been good and I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, that I wrote it. You know, I think that was May, 2016. So that was actually that same, I was when I was back home on that same cross back in Virginia at my mom's house on that same cross country trip that I mentioned where I ended up meeting the fantasy okay. footballers. So Long, long time ago now. And, and that's a funny thing. I, this is, I think, the, one of the many podcasts I've been on uh, you know, recently, just in the last couple months, talking about this story. And to me, I'm like, and this is the cool part about it is, you know, that was so long ago in the journey. And I think that very much at that point when I wrote it was a good time to say, like, hey, here's what I've accomplished from a weight and fitness and lifestyle perspective. But we've made so many changes in development since then, you know, and that's a key message, I think, of the story coming out of it years later, which is this is an ongoing process. This is not something that stops. This is not uh, this is a, that's why I, I don't talk about being on diets. I don't talk about being on plans. I talk about lifestyle changes. And that's what this has been for me. It's a major lifestyle change. So, yeah, I mean, I think putting the story out there. Um, I'm not good at being vulnerable in my personal life, which <laughs> it might be surprising to people who would then go and read a story where I talk about mental health, losing a hundred pounds, you know, being 315 pounds at different, at a different point in my life and the changes that have, have come from that. I don't think many people would say like, well, this is a guy who really struggles to be vulnerable, but uh, ask my ex-girlfriends, they'll tell you, uh, <laughs> you know, like th this. I is, heard that, man. I heard that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it, and it, I think that, it goes back to, and why I, you, I think your question was, uh, I've what's your, at this point, but keep on rolling, keep on rolling. Yeah. Right. Like what's your reaction to it? Um, that people are still talking about it, that people still want to know and that there's more of the story to tell and there's still an audience for it. My reaction to that is mission accomplished because what, I set out to do by writing that was exactly the same thing as what we talked about with backyard banter, right? Like, I am so grateful to be alive that I made it out of a very, very dark period of my life that I wasn't sure if I was going to make it out of and have come out of it having lost a hundred pounds, having made physical changes to my body that I never could have imagined. And oh, by the way, I live in Los Angeles. I have a, a damn dream job talking and writing about football. Okay, relax. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm, I'm saying, like, I'm, kidding, I'm, I'm kidding. saying, I, I, I know, I, I'm not I'm like, yeah. let me just get my back pad in here. But like, I'm saying, I have, I came out of this horrible period to this. Like, I, I'm, I'm not here to to say like, look at me and what an amazing thing that I've done. 
the point of it more is to say like, hey, if the person that I was could do this, you can do this 100%. It is possible. These changes are possible. These lifestyle alterations are possible. And my story is a proof of that. And the fact that people are still talking about it is great because that was why I wanted to write it. It, it was to inspire people that need it because I know at one point in my life, I really, really needed it. So I'm grateful that it's still part of the conversation. And I think that I need to do more. I think I can do more to, to continue to talk about this. And I, that's why I like to take opportunities like this to do so. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, it, it's funny that you mentioned like expressing yourself. And this is something that like, I have been fascinated by over the last few years, because I had not really like when I said like, I hear you with the ex girlfriends thing, like I really meant that for a minute. And <laughs> now when I uh, now when I think of who I am is just a complete 180 spin from who I was just a couple of years ago. Like I was not someone who liked to express myself, um, let alone like on camera, just like in person, even with like some of my closest friends, I wouldn't always tell them what was going on just because I don't know, I like to keep my personal stuff personal. And I realized like, there are uh, many, many ways to express yourself. And there are many ways that you can feel comfortable doing so. And it's like, it's kind of an ongoing search to do so. And for me, like I, I've been I vlog also, like I do a lot of fantasy football stuff, but I like to vlog on my channel. And um, in those vlogs, I get super, super vulnerable. And it, it's those are my favorite pieces of content to put out because I know when I get uh, an email or comments down below saying like, yo, this helped me or this was this was awesome to be able to relate to like, those are my favorite pieces of content that I could uh, that I could put out. And, you know, it, it, it was like something that kind of switched in my head a long time ago. It was a relationship that I had. And I felt like the reason that it ended was because it, it was my fault. And I felt like I hadn't been open enough and been able to express myself enough. And after that, I was like, if I don't kind of change how I am or who I am as a person like that, um, then I'm going to have like problems going forward the same way. And I kind of just realized it and, and flipped the switch, I guess you could say, and when I, when I turn on the camera, like when I start recording something, I just like, it, it's just so comfortable to me. I don't know why most people aren't that like good in front of a camera or, or comfortable, I should say, not good. Um, but it's, it's like an ongoing search for you. And it could be through camera. It could be through blogging like you did. You know, that was a way for you to express yourself. It could be through art, music. Like there's a million uh, different ways that you can figure out how to be comfortable with yourself. And it's always like an ongoing journey. But the, the, the basis goes back to like being vulnerable is while it seems scary at first, it's the best thing you could ever do for yourself. Because once you could like figure out your vulnerabilities and kind of like flip them and turn them into positives or, you know, strengths, you know, that is when I think you're really free to, um, to, to do everything it is that you want to do. Now, I know that got like very, very deep and I just went off on a tangent, but I want to bring up some of the quotes that I actually pulled from, um, from the blog post that you put out a few years ago. Now, um, I'm going to read them off and then we're going to kind of get into the theme of the sentence, I guess you could say. You had one quote in there that said, the way I packed on pounds was my fault and mine alone. I can't blame my parents. There's no fingers to point at society or modern technology. I stayed fat because I wanted to. I didn't know how much I hated it or the way the negativity of my consistent weight gain consumed me until much later in life. Now, you start off the sentence with saying it's your fault. And I think that's like such a big, big key to people's success or just their happiness. What does it mean? Like, how, how do you feel about taking ownership of, of everything that happens in your life? Yeah, well, number one, it's really weird to hear uh, <laughs> my own writing read back to me, <laughs> especially because I don't like that's I may have reread that piece once since I've written it, you know, which was years ago, but it's not like something I, I go back and I mean, I know all those feelings because I, I wrote them, right, and I, right. I still feel them, but it's still like, whoa, that's weird. <laughs> but nevertheless, like, I think that like saying it's my fault, taking ownership of it. It's a balance because um, my current, my current, I, I'm in therapy. I have been in and out for since uh, the story that I told in that article, uh, my, my current therapist says, uh, you're too, way too hard on yourself. I said, well, you know, I don't think you're hard enough on me. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a delicate, it's a delicate balance, but, yeah. um, I think take like being able to say something is your fault and taking ownership of it for certain people, not for everybody, but definitely for someone like me is crucial to taking that first step to change it, taking that first step to get out of it. Um, because it, it was so easy for me to be comfortable and to be content with the weight that I had packed on and the negativity that I felt because of that. 
So for me, it, it was something if I can say, look, this is, this is my fault. And it's also, it's also objectively true. Like yeah. that was taking the lenses off of any sort of rose colored glasses that I wanted to paint my paint for myself. Um, you know, my mom always pushed me to, to lose weight and to be healthier because her father had died of a heart attack when she was a teenager. You know, that this was something that was a fear for her. And I never took that seriously. You know, I never listened to my own mother, like, you know, basically say like, Matt, you gotta, you gotta get healthier. Like bad things are going to happen to you. And like, just didn't connect that in my own brain. And, and I mean, again, this is subjectively true that this was my, this was my fault. This was something that was born out by my own decision-making and was made worse when I had the power to make my own decisions. When I was in high school and could drive, you know, I would take myself to the fattiest food possible. You know, I would, when I didn't have parental supervision around to, you know, maybe say like, Hey, don't get it. You know, don't get two appetizers before your dinner. Like, you know, it was quite all right to do that. So my own decision-making was, was, was causing the problem to become worse. And yeah, so I, I think that taking ownership of it, um, you know, and, and for me, it's completely, maybe for everybody else, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent ownership. But for me, I've found that when I can take fault in something that motivates me to want to change it much more than just saying like, this is something that happened to me. No, this, this has been caused by my, my own decision making. Yeah. I look at it kind of from, um, not so much, I guess, like a health perspective, but if I'm running a team or something, you know, um, and we have someone doing this and someone doing that and someone like, and if I'm the top of the team, right. And they're doing things under me and someone messes up. Like, I think the, the easiest way to understand that you're not a good leader, I guess you could say, and I'm probably not putting this right, but I mean, like you're also the one that put them in charge. So it's like taking responsibility for not only your actions, but understanding that you overall have the most impact on like what's going on around you. And sometimes when I say like, I, I like to take responsibility for everything that happens to me, like sometimes that I, things I have absolutely no control of, I also like to just be like, okay, you know what, that was, that was my fault. And maybe that is to a fault in a sense. And you say like, uh, you know, maybe that's not for everybody and probably true. But I figure like once you actually switch the mindset to being like, not, not just like everything is my fault, but I control everything that happens to me, you know? So it's like when you, when you, when you flip it that way, it gives you a sense of relief because you don't want to rely on other people while it's good to obviously have other people there and helping you out and stuff. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, you need to be able to understand that if something goes wrong, maybe it's your fault, maybe it's their fault, but you have to have a positive mindset in order, um, in order to go forward with it. So let's spin this back to football for a second to make an analogy here. So okay. One of, one of my, one of my favorite podcasts that I, you know, was on regularly, uh, one of my favorites to listen to was the draft breakdown podcast with Justin Higdon and Seth Cox. It's no longer um, in play because obviously draft breakdown is shut down, but I loved those guys because they were just honest and truthful about the draft process and draft evaluation. Um, and often in a very irreverent and almost harsh way, which again, I like, but the, the, the draft process is filled with so much BS that a lot of honesty is, is appreciated. And I always like to go on the show because of that. And, you know, one of their jokes on the show, and we would always make it when I went on was, well, you can always be right about a draft prospect because the two excuses for, for them not working out in the league. Oh, well, they got injured or the coaches weren't using them. Right. right. Like that. And then, okay, you can write off any failure. That's perfect. Yeah, it go in, uh, injuries or coaches wasn't using them right. I mean, ever and so I would always say that when we go on and review my mistakes. Well, yeah, the coaches aren't using them right. But if I actually did that, if that was really what I did with reception perception, how would I ever learn what this process really was telling me? What these metrics were really telling me? How would I learn to evaluate better? I would keep making the same mistakes over and over again if I really just accepted those two mindsets. And I say all the time now with reception perception, whenever I'm talking about it, that I made conclusions two or three years ago based on the data that I would never make today, because that's just what happens when you have a larger sample size, you have more to go off, you have more to understand. So, but if I had never, but if I just stayed with those two mindsets, if I had never really accepted reality of like these mistakes are because of my own issues and interpreting my own data, which I did not fully understand yet, because it was still so new. 
um, I would never learn anything and it would never get better and I'd keep making those same mistakes that I've made in the past with my own series. And as that reflects to a lifestyle perspective, if I continue to just write off things that were happening to me, negativity that I was feeling uh, or the weight that I was gaining based on other factors, not, and like you said, not realizing that no matter how it's happening to me, I'm the one that controls how, to, how I can respond to it and what I can do about it. I would still be in that state. Well, I don't even know if I'd be here. So that's, I mean, that's the reality of the situation is that uh, in order to learn and grow, you have to accept responsibility and you have to find ways to change and not just, not just saying that you're feeling the way you're feeling because of injuries and uh, the coaches aren't using them right. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think it's, it's, it's also a way that people kind of deter things. And if they have goals or something, they stop chasing them because X, Y, Z happened and they don't, want to you know say that i'm the reason why it didn't happen or i'm not i'm too lazy or i'm not working hard enough so it's like sometimes you know it is like something physical that happens you go like oh i blame that but a lot of time i think it's people not taking responsibility because they're they're masking you know something that deep down they don't really want to go after or they're, or they're scared of or something like that so um i'm gonna move on to a second quote this might be the last one i, I don't want to put you through too too much torture with these quotes because <laughs> uh, i'm with you man once if i put a piece of content out like video anything like no way I'm watching that again. It was like the, the first time was okay. I lived through it. I'm not watching that again. It can get kind of cringy at times. Um, but no, your, your, your article is not cringy, by the way. So that, I didn't mean that to come off that way. Uh, so the second one, I had a list of what was acceptable to buy at the grocery store, taped to my refrigerator. And if something didn't make it on the list, it didn't come into the apartment. So I, I think that's like very interesting because that's a very like black and white view. And some people have control where, you know, they can, I'll go to, over to a friend's house and they'll have an entire, you know, cabinet full of snacks and things like that. And they'll be fine. Like I'll go over there and then next week I'll go over and like literally none of it was touched. And I was like, how do you do that? Like, I can't do that if I'm in my house with all the snacks there. Right. It's interesting because I, I think of it from, from not just like a, a health and food perspective, but this can be put into so many different things. It's like, for instance, like a drug addict or an alcoholic or something. It's like, they can't have one beer or two beers. It turns into something else. And that's with food. And that's with um, a lot of different situations. So you're someone who needs to be like black and white. Have you kind of, as you've evolved and you've become more of like who you are as a person and understanding yourself better, are you still that strict? No. <laughs> I mean, that, like we were saying earlier was that the process has changed a lot. The lifestyle has changed. Um, at the beginning, I absolutely had to be that strict because this was this was a Cleveland Brown style tear down and rebuild back up. You know, I mean, that's why the, the title of the piece is literally "Rebuilding a Broken House" because that's what I viewed this operation as. This was not paint the shutters, trim the hedges, like let's put some, you know, let's let's like get some new patio furniture, whatever. Let's just make the appearance look good. No, this was a tear the house down down to its very foundation and build it back up. And because of that, I knew that I needed to be strict because at that point, I did not understand what the words self-control meant. <laughs> you know, I did not understand that as a thing. Um, now, sure, actually, there's been a bag of Chex Mix in my, uh, in my pantry since I got back from a flight from Tampa in January. I just, <laughs> Yay. Yeah, all right, I'm just not even eating. I mean, look, there's a, I'm at my office. I'm at the Yahoo office right now. There's a free food every day at lunch and breakfast. There's a lot of potential to make bad choices. There's a little snack. There's, I was pissed when they put, speaking of Chex Mix, because I got a problem with Chex Mix. I was one of my favorite <laughs> snack foods. Um, and there's a, the, in the little bird feeders down the hall where you can, uh, you yeah, can just yeah. get a bunch of snacks every day. For some reason, some jackass decided to make Chex Mix uh, one of the options about a month ago. And uh, I haven't touched it, uh, but I want to, and it's there. <laughs> and uh, but so, like I said, you can now I yeah, now I understand how to have a little self-control. You know, now I understand boundaries. Um, but back then, yeah, I definitely needed to be black and white. Um, I needed this to be a total and complete teardown because, I mean, to be honest with you, I was making unhealthy choices in a lot of different ways, you know, not just with food, but with the way I was living with uh, what I, what I was doing to my body, what I was, uh, what I was drinking, you mm -hmm. know, et cetera, all that stuff. So food was something that I could control um, because my life felt so out of control to me. So this was a way of, of doing that. And 
as a start, that was great. But, and that is the, that is what I want to keep reiterating here is that this is a process. It's a lifestyle change. It's ongoing. There are things that I bring into the house now that I wouldn't have back then. Uh, there are parts of my diet that were, cru- you know, like no carbs and no sugar. You know, now I realize with my certain fitness goals, you know, want to put on more muscle, whatever, like you need to have some carbs in your life. <laughs> so it's a process and it is changing. It is ongoing. Um, and that's key to realize too, that you, you can't be black and white forever. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think about like, I was telling you, I just moved into this new apartment and I felt like I had been kind of hitting a stride prior to moving in, like hitting a stride um, just, just like business wise and professional wise. And like this move kind of made me nervous. because I had still been living at home prior to moving out here on my own. Uh, and, and now it's going to be like a whole lifestyle change. And I was someone like you who in college, uh, you know, typical weekend nights, Friday, Saturday, you're pounding beers like Tuesday or Thursday, one or the other, sometimes both, you know, and it was one of those things. And like that stuff can hold you back so much. And you just see it. it's because like, it's all your friends. It's all the people you're surrounded with are constantly doing it, too. So that's a way for you to tell yourself, like, oh, you know what, if I do it once or twice or, you know, if I just do it as much as them it's fine. I can still do what I want to do. But it's like, if you want to live differently and you keep reiterating the lifestyle change, like you really have to change. And I think if I looked at myself five years ago compared to like what I'm doing now, I can't say I'm surprised I'm here, but the amount of change I've had to put in as like a person is just, is substantial. And there's a lot of people out there that want to get things done and you really do have to sacrifice a lot of things. I mean, there are people that you're probably not going to be like friends with. And it's not because they're a bad person or you're a bad person. It's just like what your ideals and what your values are and the things that you enjoy, like are going to change as you change your goals as you get older. And so when I'm saying like, you know, you you can be black and white with food and you can be black and white with all these other things. It's it's much more encompassing than that. You think about like every part of your life and it really is a lifestyle change for you. Well, it's growth too. I mean, it's starting at this very, it's, it's just like decision-making maturity, man. When you're younger, you do, you do see things as so black and white. And uh, when I was younger in my lifestyle and fitness journey, journey, I did see things as needing to be very black and white. Now uh, I can be okay with the fact that this Saturday I will, I will be at the LA beer fest downtown. I'm going to drink way too much beer. I'm going to probably drink, I'm probably going to eat something horrible for me while I'm out there. I'll probably go out with my friends afterwards and make more of those decisions, but that's okay. Yeah. (laughs) That's okay. Because, you know, the other six days of the week, I'm very comfortable with what I'm eating, what I'm doing, et cetera. Now, as you mentioned, you can't make those decisions four days out of the week uh, or else you're really going to throw yourself off track. But yeah, I mean, I, pro- I promise you, uh, while on Monday I talked about this new juicing thing that I'm doing in the morning on my Instagram feed, uh, come Saturday, it's going to look a little different on the Instagram feed. So, right. I, and, that, and again, that's okay. That's part of growth and that's part of maturing your decision making and maturing just the, the way that you interact with the world around you is that there's a lot of gray areas Um, And as long as you have a clear vision and a pure goal in mind, you're going to probably be able to hit that while also, uh, you know, moving into the gray area just just a little bit. Yeah. Like when I imagine moving into New York, I, 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 my immediate thought was like, okay, I'm going to be out every Friday, every Saturday, and probably again, once during the week. But like, now that I have my goals here, I'm, 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 I'm picturing a life where, you know, those things aren't as important for me. So like, yeah, I will have days where I go out to brunch on Saturday and I start drinking at 10 AM and I don't get home till like midnight. You know what I mean? Like, and those are going to be fun days. Like I love that. I need that stuff to like keep me rejuvenated and keep me young. But I also know that I can't do that every day if, if I want to have the energy because this stuff, like the stuff you're passionate about takes so much energy out of you and it has to, you have to go in it with the right mindset. And if, and if you're hung over, like you're not going to want to work out and then you're not going to want to work. And some, you know, the older you get that, that shit gets way worse. So if I go out on a yeah. Friday night, like I'm not going to be able to do really quality work until probably Monday morning and maybe Sunday I might be stretching a little bit, but the overall point remains. So, um, people out there like lifestyle change is really important and, and get people that are behind you to, to help you out with it. And, and you will be fine. He is a, a living example of that. Uh, and, in terms of, you know, being at the bottom, I'm telling you, please go read the article and then come back and watch this part if you want to. Now, there are probably a lot of people in the audience that are maybe struggling with a fitness journey. 
right now. And it's completely understandable. Um, I had never really been someone who was like overweight. So I never gotten to the point where it was, you know, a, a big problem for me in my mind. <laughs> but I think a lot of people, you know, like yourself would start maybe a fitness trend for like two or three weeks and it's a diet maybe, and you lose, you know, six, seven, eight pounds. Now you realize that that's, that's pretty much water weight in the beginning. And it's much more of a, a long run. And those people get discouraged after that stops after, you know, a couple of weeks. And like, I look at that as well as, you know, um, from like a business perspective too, because you're putting in so much work, right? You're putting in so much work in the front end without any guaranteed success. So I think a lot of the reason those people get discouraged is because the, the weight stops dropping off the scale and they don't know if they're doing it right still, right? They don't know that it is a process and you might not lose any weight for two and a half weeks. And then all of a sudden the next day, you're going to drop four pounds on the scale, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the things that happen. So like if, if you're in that person's situation, obviously you've been there, like what's your biggest piece of advice to someone who, you know, maybe started off hot and is getting discouraged now that they're like a few weeks, a few months into it. And maybe they're losing a little bit of that mental edge. Well, you have to find the plan that works for you um, because that's was, that, this was definitely true throughout my life that while I never really took ownership over my weight, never really was serious about it, there were obviously times before my massive weight loss where I went to gyms, you know, I, but I didn't know what I was doing, right? You know, I, I would go in there, you know, mess around with some push-ups, uh, get on the treadmill till I hated it, which, you know, is usually like three minutes. Um, but, <laughs> you know, did some crunches, whatever. But I'm going in there kind of blind, right? Um, and you never see any results. And then, like, two weeks later, you're like, like you said, why am I even doing this? Like, right. I'm doing this thing that I hate, uh, and I'm not seeing any benefit from it. I'm going to stop. I'm going to continue to, to gain weight. Um, and, and that's a problem for so many people. The thing that changed for me when it really started to work was I actually sat down, you know, when I decided I wanted to make this massive change, I, I sat down with a trainer. I talked about what's a plan that could really fit my goals and where I was at physically then, which obviously was not a good place. So it's, it's about finding whatever is going to work for you. And I would encourage everybody to talk with the professional. If you join a gym, you know, they'll usually give you a free session, take that free session. Even if, even if it's stuff that you're not going to use forever, uh, it's good to jump up. You don't have to, you know, pay for an expensive personal trainer or whatever, but, and even if you can't, even if you can't find a free session or something like that, there's so much information out there on YouTube, out on the internet, you know, whatever, go check it out and, and try a couple of different things and see what ends up working for you. Uh, I, I would just say that that is, that is the key for me. It's finding that finding plans at the right time that uh, fit what I needed in the moment. Like I mentioned right now, I'm on a new, I'm on a new plan, a new thing right now. And, and it's working really well. Um, things I'd tried the previous few months weren't working that well. And uh, that's okay. It is very much a trial and error process. So I would say don't get complacent in something um, that isn't working for you and don't uh, don't be upset if that happens because everybody's body is different. Yeah. There are things that are going to work for you that aren't going to work for me. There are things that are going to work for me that aren't going to work for, you know, my friends. And that's okay. Keep trying different things. Again, I would encourage everybody to talk to a professional or find, out, find more information on the internet uh, because there's just so much out there. I found a lot of the plans that I've ended up doing by know doing probably way too way too much but doing a lot of research and a lot of searching online and again sometimes I do something and it turns out it's not going to work but uh, finding that doing that trial and error process I think is really important yeah absolutely and the key word there is process and that was something I kind of started out you know this little segment into was comparing it to you know a business or something because think about it like when say you started a blog like you don't expect success out of the gate you might not see an, an ounce of success for a year and a half two years and that's not the, that's not the case with fitness if you are working hard and you're doing things like semi correctly you will see results you know relatively quickly but it's the same thing man if you want success and if you want to go through the process one you have to enjoy the process so very very important to find something that one not only works for you but that you enjoy and I found myself as I'm getting older I'd always been into like weightlifting and you know just doing free weights and, and bench press and that kind of stuff 
But like, as I'm getting older, I'm starting to enjoy much different types of exercises, whether it's like meditation, even I know that's not really physical exercise, but like those kind of things that are more of like a balanced, healthy, um, I, I guess, aspect of, of fitness and exercise. Like when you think about balance, it's something you've brought up a lot. Do you um, change, I guess, your routine? Like how, how do you how do you incorporate balance into your like fitness and exercise routine? Yeah. The temptation, especially when like, cause now at this point I can say, I love working out. I love health and fitness. I mean, I would like, if you had told me that I would say that like six years ago, I'd have probably slapped you because that's a stupid thing. That's a stupid thing to even think that I would ever enjoy, but uh, it's true. So now there is the balance to not overdo it. Uh, there is that reality, which I think is different for, a lot of people. Um, but for me, that's, yeah, the bringing that balance to not overdo it is key, you know, to, okay, I've worked out four days out of the week, like, maybe don't put because your body needs rest, your body yeah. needs rejuvenation, like you can't be sitting there, you know, cranking weights for seven days a week. It's yeah, not I didn't, I didn't believe that when I was younger, I didn't think rest <laughs> was like really that important. I was like, nah, we're gonna get that six day in. And now I'm getting older. And I'm like, I love working out three to four days a week. I, I mean, I have a busy schedule. Otherwise, so it's not like, it's not like I really can push it that much further, but I've realized that my body likes not going as much as I used to. Yeah. And that's, that's still something that's hard for me to accept because I am very, you know, we talked about how I would feel putting that, um, putting that article out there. Um, just putting yourself out there in a physical or a mental or a, a personal way is really hard for me. Um, okay. I don't, I don't have the greatest, body or self image. So sometimes I have, I put this pressure on myself, like, Oh man, I didn't work out this day. Um, and I got to go be on camera. I'm not going to look good. Like I, I'm not going to look my, at my peak or whatever. And I get in my head about that. And then I end up overworking my body or I do push myself that fifth day of the week or that sixth day of the week. And you know, that's n not good for you. And, uh, it's, it's this like short term benefit that you've tricked and like guess what like nobody's probably gonna notice except you like that's that's 100%. the reality that I, well, I mean one workout does absolutely nothing the way I think about it too is like you know if you you can go to the gym and do the workout but at the end of the day the diet I mean the, the exercise is very important but the diet is is tenfold in, in terms of yeah. you know, what your weight is going to be because you know you can go work out lift weights and maybe burn 250 calories and then eat that in one bite, you know what I mean? So it's like a workout is good, is good because you're told that exercise is what helps you lose weight, but but the diet is so, so much more important. So when I'm like, oh no, I only went four times instead of six, I'm like, dude, that's like maybe 450, 500 calories extra that you're burning that you could either just not eat and there you go, like that kind of solves the problem, you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's another thing too, I think for people who are getting stuck in you know your previous question like people who are getting stuck at, at this like plateau or whatever um or can't quite get off the the tarmac there i think that one thing that's key that i never realized until i really started this journey was diet and exercise they got to go together like you can't do one or the other at different points in my life i thought well i can always just eat like hell and uh you know i'll work out and that'll work never work or well i can just I don't really have to work out, but if I just eat this salad instead of this burger, no, it doesn't work. Like you've got to make, and, and, and your, your diet has to match your fitness goals. Like I said, yeah. at different times in my life when I've wanted to not necessarily cut a lot of weight, but pack on like bulk up and, and build some muscle tone, whatever, that's when you want to bring in some, you know, some smarter carbs and everything like that. So th yeah, your diet and your fitness plan should really, they've got to be hand in hand or you're never going to see major results. I, I believe that. Yeah. And like you said, there's so many free resources out there. And I know like when I first started getting into fitness, it was probably like my freshman year of college, sophomore year of college when I realized that I can't like eat like a freshman college kid <laughs> and still like maintain figure, you know? Um, that's when I started getting into it. And one of the first resources that I jumped on was YouTube. Some of my favorite YouTube channels I still follow to this day that are awesome with fitness, awesome with nutrition. Like think about any YouTube video you've ever seen. And you're like, this is cool. Trust me, there are niche YouTube channels that do whatever your favorite passions are. So go find them. I will link down below in the description 
three or four or five of my favorite YouTube channels for fitness and nutrition. And I promise you that you guys will like those. If you are starting out, like you said, it can be intimidating to figure out because that's, you know, we, we gave a lot of information. So it's like, where do I start? How do I do the diet? How do I, you know, go to the gym and work out correctly for my body type and all those things. There are a lot to it, but guys, don't, don't make it too difficult. Try to find something you enjoy. Try to do it three, four times a week and try to eat right. And whatever that means to you, um, you'll be able to figure that out if, if, you know, if you really want to make the change. Um, so and, and hey, by the way, just speaking on YouTube real quick, like one thing I would say to anybody that wants to get started in a fitness journey or wants to maybe take the next step, one thing I would encourage everyone to do uh, is to learn how to cook and learn to fall in love with it. Because if there's one thing that, I mean, one of my favorite things to do now is to cook. I love. Me too. That's like my favorite part of the day, to, to be honest, after being in this office and, you know, hearing people pitch a bunch of BS, and terrible content, whatever, sometimes and me putting out terrible content or, you know, it's whatever. It's my favorite part of the day is when I get to come home and make myself dinner. And I don't do a lot of meal prepping simply for the fact that I like the preparation part of it. That's something that I really and truly have fallen in love with. And if you want, like, talk about the tremendous free resource that is YouTube, there are so many good cooking channels on YouTube that you can like learn you can, that you can watch great content and also learn how to up your game in the kitchen. And I would it's really incredible. It really is incredible what you could find on the internet nowadays. What is your, uh, what, what's your go-to meal? My go-to meal. Uh, I, I'm like, am I trying to have fun here? I'm like my go-to meal. No, like, like you're, you know, you're off of work. It's maybe eight o'clock and you're just tired going home. You're going to cook yourself a nice dinner because you haven't eaten too much today. Boom. Oh. <sighs> okay. Well, I mean, reality, I do cook a lot. I mean, everybody knows the Brussels sprouts, right? If you followed me for a long time, uh, I did run a campaign in support of Brussels sprouts, uh, <laughs> which is the dumbest thing I've ever done. I mean, I don't know. I've done so many dumb things in my career. Like, for the brand, baby. For the brand. For the brand. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's a go-to for me. They're quick. They're easy, easy to prep. Um, I do just like a good piece. If I'm, I, the one thing I do usually meal prep is I will like, uh, this is another thing too. I forgot to do it this morning. I was supposed to put chicken in the slow cooker, uh, but <laughs> way to go, Harmon. Uh, but yeah, like get it. I do like just throw in a bunch of chicken with like a good homemade sauce that I've, I've prepared, throw it into the slow cooker. You've got chicken for the rest of the week. That's easy to do. Um, but if I'm doing like, just one off thing, I do like a good pork chop. Um, okay. You know, sear it on both sides, stick it in the oven for a little bit a good way to live and I, but I will tell you like my go-to vegetable when I'm in a like when I just want a quick dinner um I I, I will I will eat a lot of kale my friend really people, people do not like kale I am a 100% kale truther um uh, yeah what <laughs> <laughs> how do you like do you prepare it or so the way I've done it now, yeah, no, I don't eat it raw. I'm not a psycho. Although I, I, I thought that was like the, I thought when you just went to like scratch your beard, I thought you were imitating like you just taking out of the bag and you're like, this is how I eat it. And you just eat it. No, raw. no, no, no. I mean, I'm not crazy. Not that crazy. At least. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but like right now my go-to way to do it is just put a whole like baking sheet, just put a whole bunch of kale on it, throw some olive oil on it, put whatever seasoning you like on it, stick it in the oven for like 10 minutes. It gets nice and crispy toss it a little bit, put it back in the oven for a bit. I like to put some like roasted walnuts on it. Uh, no salt or anything like no salted walnuts, anything like that, but you know, some nuts, real good source of protein, good source of fat, and then put a meat in there, put it in a bowl. That's good enough for me. And, and I, I have probably become a little uh, ridiculous with some of the healthy <laughs> foods that I've eaten. And I don't know that it's for everybody, but uh, it's a good I will tell you, have. yeah, that's a good, that has, that has really been like a go-to way to get my vegetable source in. Uh, like when I, when I come home and cook and if, if I'm not trying to impress anybody else, I will eat that like four days, uh, four days out of the week. Um, I and, yeah. Uh, my, I eat probably like a, a, some kind of one off version of like a Chipotle bowl, like two times a day, every single yeah. day. I'll just make like a giant salad throw. I don't know what kind of meat I usually do ground beef and ground beef gets a bad rap, man. I know it's kind of unhealthy because it's a red meat, but like nutrition wise, if you get lean ground beef, like 93 or 96, yeah it's it's really nothing worse than chicken it's crazy sure. and sure. uh yeah and I'll, I'll throw some kind of meat in there i'll throw I, I always have onions and peppers on hand i will cut them up and i'll sear i'll throw them in the skillet also if you don't like the taste of a vegetable like if you don't really like broccoli 
and you throw it on a skillet and kind of crisp it up, I found yeah. that I, I absolutely, I don't know if that like kills all of the nutrition facts and actually makes it bad for you, not bad for you, but it, you know, loses any purpose of actually eating broccoli. But if you haven't like seared, just turn on a skillet, throw it medium high heat or whatever, throw some oil on there and let that, let that thing burn up a little bit. That'll make your, your, uh, your vegetables taste very good. So yeah. that's, that's food facts over here. One-on-one from, from Mr. Matt Harmon himself. <laughs> I will say every Friday, if I don't have plans, um, this is like my treat to myself. It's not quite like a cheat meal or anything like that. Cause I, I'm comfortable eating red meat a couple times a week because, uh, I work out a lot. I lift a lot of weights. Like I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to put on some muscle here too, you know? Uh, so I'm comfortable okay. with, a, with a good like steak every Friday. Uh, if I, you know, have a beer, have a glass, have a, a glass of wine, a glass of bourbon, whatever, whatever with it. Uh, you know, that's, that's a great way to, that's a great way to live your life, man. You got to treat yourself too, especially if you're, uh, if you're, if you're eating really well, you deserve uh, those sort of breaks. So I've already got my, I've already got my ribeye uh, in the fridge for tomorrow. And uh, I can't hey, wait. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I got to pick up some steaks, I guess. I'm still kind of figuring out the neighborhood over here. I don't know. I don't know where to go for the good meat. I'll figure it out. Though. Um, what, what, just a curious question right now. What, uh, what exactly are you doing? Like, what's your exercise regimen right now? You're putting on uh, weight. So I'm assuming you're just doing a lot of weightlifting. Yeah, I do a lot of weightlifting right now. Um, I just don't like the last four weeks uh well four to eight weeks um was uh was doing like much more of a heavy low rep high weight uh routine where i was trying to put on more muscle trying to bulk up i feel really good about that now so now i'm i'm switching more to more high intensity more high high uh high reps well more high intensity with cardio and then uh more high reps with weightlifting um in order to uh really just shed like four to five pounds that I'd like to, I'd like to shed off before I have to go to Nashville for the NFL draft and uh, make a lot of decisions, <laughs> bad decisions. There. You're going? Yeah, I'll be there. I will be there too. I'm, I'm going to hit you oh, up. Perfect. There. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely, definitely do that. But yeah, so right now um, that's kind of my focus uh, more, more, especially focusing on the core. Um, some like the back is super important. You got to be careful with it, of course, but uh, definitely doing a lot of work on that. A lot of work on the core. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I, I mentioned this juicing thing that I'm doing. This is my, four, I'm, I'm going to do it every day uh, until the NFL draft. Um, every morning I used to eat before I'd go work out two hard boiled eggs and two pieces of whole grain toast. Cause again, I'm trying to bulk up whatever. Um, I've been doing that for almost two years. And just this month I'm switching to uh, just, the, I still eat the two, the two hard boiled eggs uh, for no reason, but just for the protein. <laughs> So hard boiled eggs are like not fun to eat, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's not like an enjoyable experience. This is the worst uh, way to eat an egg. There's so many good enjoyable uh, ways to eat an egg, and you choose to do that. But it's convenient. And on the weekends, I'm not eating the damn hard boiled egg. But uh, <laughs> on the weekday before I go into the office at seven okay. to work out. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I'm not a, again. I'm not a psycho. I'm not just sitting there mashing raw kale and hard boiled eggs. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> what That's what I'm imagining right now. <laughs> oh yeah, the real sadness uh, that that would be. But so now I'm, I've replaced the toast with this juice that's packed with kale, celery, uh, almond milk, and I'll tell you what, man. Like for one, I feel tighter. I feel better already after just like four days of doing it. Um, it it's been great so far, and and that is part of the yeah the goal right now, which is to just after putting on some muscle and feeling good about my frame. Okay, I want to just shed a few layer extra layers of fat. But we'll see after I screw it all up on Saturday at the beer fest. Yeah, and then if not on Saturday, then definitely in Nashville. Yeah, um, definitely in Nashville. I mean, it's all 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 all, uh, all hands on deck. You know, this is going to be a crisis. all bets are off. Yeah, it's going to be. Yeah. Great. I can't wait to go. Um, so let me let me just ask you real quick, circling back to like the exercise routine. Now you got like semi in detail, and you're like, yeah, we're doing more like low reps, um, high high weight to you know build strength and, and muscle and hypertrophy and things like that. Like, how did you learn about that stuff? I know it's been a long process, so. You've probably done a bunch of research on your own. Do you have a trainer that you work with now? Or are you like asking the people, you know, obviously you have a lot of people that are sports related. They, I'm sure you could ask for advice. Um, how, how do you like go about learning those kind of in detail things when it comes to fitness? Yeah, I will say one of my favorite things to do, and this is like totally selfish, but uh, when I interview athletes, like I always ask for like one fitness tip uh, because look, I've got them for I've got there for 15 minutes. And to be honest, they don't want to talk about the same damn thing. Like when I interviewed Antonio Brown over the summer, uh, last summer, you know, obviously he's getting a hundred 
questions at that time, like about Le'Veon Bell's contract. I can remember sitting to wait and interview him. He's doing like a phone interview or something. He's flipping on his Instagram while he's not even paying, t- paying attention. Like, cause this is like the 30th person to ask him about Le'Veon Bell's contract situation. So when I, but when I asked him about, I asked him about a lot of different things when it comes to routes, whatever, all this other stuff, but the most engaged and like mind blown he was for me was when we talked about like, okay, can you give me a couple like, general fitness pointers like i'm looking to do this i'm looking to do that, I um, love that. Yeah. yeah yeah i mean that's what look whatever you think about these pro athletes like one thing you cannot deny is that they are several steps ahead of you several steps ahead of me uh most of the general population on health and fitness right and that, i mean that's just a reality like i mean they're they're in, well, they do for a living pretty yeah, well. that's what they're, that's their job their bodies are their jobs Right. And for somebody like Antonio Brown, who has taken that more seriously than maybe any other player in the NFL, I mean, yeah, yeah to get to, I mean, I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to ask him, I, look, it's never going to make the video interview, but I'm going to take something. <laughs> so thank you, Yahoo Sports, for that. Um, but yeah, yeah, well, that was, uh, I was asking him about, like, what should I, like, I know not to eat, like, late at night, but um, what should I probably may, maybe not eat during dinner? And he's like, you really need to, and I told him, I was like, I eat a lot of avocado, whatever. He's like, don't eat your avocado at night. Eat it in the morning because it's good, it's good fat for you. He's like, but think, but if you're eating it before you eat late at night, you're, you're end up just sleeping with your fat. You don't want to sleep with your fat, do you? I was like, no, not really. <laughs> yeah, right. Sounds uncomfortable. I eat so much avocado. Yeah. That's like one of six foods that I eat a tremendous amount of. Oh, uh, me too. A hundred percent. Now I focused on eating it more before or after I work out, not at night, you know, cause I work out in the morning. So usually, um, I'll eat it either before that or after that. And, and yeah, so now I've made it more of a breakfast dinner food or breakfast lunch food, not a dinner food. And, and I've definitely, uh, I think I've benefited from it. So that's uh, thank you, Antonio Brown for that. Um, but yeah, so that's what, that's one, that's one way. That's something I can do that like, great. Everybody listening is like, cool. Uh, Thanks a lot, buddy. I'm not going to get to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would definitely say that like researching on the internet is, is, is perfect. I mean, finding things like that. Uh, I do have a few friends that are personal trainers, you know, that I've made throughout my fitness journey or whatever. So I will always get a chance to pick their brains. And, you know, again, if you take that free session with the personal trainer, uh, and then you don't end up becoming a client with them, but you see them around the gym. They're not, unless they're a real jackass, they're not going to punch you in the face every time you ask for like one pointer, like, Hey, I'm doing this. What do you think? You know, so constantly picking people's brains that are specialists in the field and, uh, just generally always, always re- keeping on researching on my own. That's, that's key to it. And, uh, yeah, always just learning. Yeah. The personal trainer and like people at the gym are just people at the same time. Like if you see someone who's in really good shape, and you go up to ask them, like, hey, w- you know, what do you do for your back or whatever? They're not going to be like, fuck you, bro. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Help you, out. Like, you know what I mean? So, uh, and people at the gym want to be like, especially if you look good, they love when you, you know, compliment them or something. So they're yeah. definitely be willing to help you. So that's another piece of advice. So the internet research, personal trainers, people at the gym already, your friends that are in good shape, whatever. There's, there's tons of different ways to get started and, and to help feel comfortable when you are starting your fitness journey. So I believe that's all the questions I had for you today. That will wrap up the episode. A really, 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 really good one. Uh, Matt, thank you for coming on the channel, man. It meant uh, a lot to me as someone that I have, you know, you know watched your work grow and, and become like a, a real big personal brand on your own. So uh, thank you for coming on and let the people know where they can find you, what you would like to pitch them, s- sell them with your best shot right now. Let's get it. Yeah, well, for one, thank you so much for having me. This is an awesome conversation. And thank you for doing something like this, because I think it's needed in the space. Uh, So really cool. And and thank you so much for letting me be a part of it. Um, If people want to keep up with me, you could do so on Twitter and Instagram, Matt Harmon underscore BYB, still wearing that BYB, like, uh, talk about a bad personal branding, Uh, still wearing it like I got an ex's name tattooed on my arm. Uh, If you want to Look into Reception Perception. You can always check it out. Hashtag Reception Perception on Twitter for the graphs, the information that you're going to get. And you can purchase access to Reception Perception by just going to receptionperception.com. And then there's a link right there to purchase the Ultimate Draft Kit and get access to over 50 NFL players' uh, data right through that link. And uh, I, would, I would love you for doing it. He would love you. 
Uh, I will love you for hitting the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. I will link all of the things that he just said right down below uh, in the description along with everything else that we covered throughout the video. So thank you all for joining us thus far. Again, hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Hit the subscribe button if, uh, if you want to see more content like this. Thank you again, Matt, and, uh, and that's it for now.